Okay, folks, uh, like, like I just mentioned, for those of you who may be late to the, late to the game here, so to speak, um, we will be doing the presentation again uh, next uh, week at this time, at this location. And um, so those of you who do not want to stay and stand, again, you can either sit or uh, come back. So, we okay, Ro Rose, Rose, Rose Raymond, the vice president and curator, has asked us to count off because uh, we, you know, we, we may be exceeded the allowable amount. Uh, right. So, if we could have, if we could have a count off starting here, one. Twenty-nine, thirty-five, six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, forty, forty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four. Okay, okay, forty-three, okay, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, fifty, fifty-one, fifty-two, fifty-three, fifty-four, fifty-five. 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, okay, we're going to be okay, just, well, well, okay, so it's a, it's a it's a matter of personal comfort level, and and whatever we do whatever we do we don't want to let don't want to let the fire department know. <laughs> okay, so um, <clears throat> thank you for your um, thank you for your interest. And like I said, we will be doing it again uh, next week at the same time. I would tell you um, that. Uh, a couple, of, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, this could get real interesting. But if you need to use the bathroom downstairs, there's one, and it's unisex. So uh, just, just so you know, down at the bottom of the stairs and a hard right around the corner. Okay. A few other um, housekeeping details. Uh, we do have a new display exhibit up that just went up the first part of February. So come back. I can't even point the stuff out because because of the press of humanity here. Um, but it has to do with uh, the women, 100th anniversary of the women's um, right to vote and also uh, a nice display on women's work and uh, what, how women transition from the home to, to business um, and other industries. Um, I'm Jim Colthart. I'm the uh, part-time administrative assistant here. And uh, we will be doing, in addition to the redux of Dick's presentation next week, our next program is uh, on March 8th, and it will be uh, about the Utica Insane Asylum. So, uh, and that will be done by Joe Bottini, who is uh, an acknowledged expert on such things. Um, the, um, uh, our gala, will take place on uh, May 6th. That's open to members. Um, and it will be in this location. And I hope we have this problem. Um, but um, um, so I guess before we turn the program over to Dick, we have some folks from the fire department that are going to talk about the memorial 
um, that uh, that's being planned. So, Bill. Can everybody hear me? I don't need this thing. I'm used to yelling. So to start with, I was never going to tell the fire department if we were over, so we were all good. But um, I'm here today. To, we're, we're, we're here as a group. Our, our group is the Ed Bell Memorial, Flight 93, September 11th Memorial. If you've seen anything about it, it's been in the paper. It's being planned for the brick garden down to the school. We're going to dedicate it this September 11th. Um, and it really isn't a fire department function, although we're all in the fire department. That's kind of how we got the idea. Um, it's, it's a separate uh, community-based group. And we're raising funds to erect a memorial and also uh, put in a scholarship in Ed Felt's name going on beyond that. So this is just really raising public awareness today. Um, I'm not going to... Uh, go into great detail, but we will be here after the break. We have these beautiful uh, tribal campers that tell all about it. And we're really looking for your support as a community, but also if you can spread the word about this to other people, because we need to get the word out. You're going to see a lot of us. We're going to be on radio and TV, it looks like, in the next coming months. And uh, we're just trying to get the word out. September 11th is coming very quickly, and I just want to introduce the people who are here today that are also on the committee. Skip Beardsall, he's the president, sitting right here. Peter Goodfriend, and this is actually Ed's brother, Gordy Felt. Uh, <laughs> and I'm sure you all probably know, but Ed was on the, the ill-fated Flight 93 on September 11th. Nothing, you know, we've never done anything as a community for this participation in this first, really this first fight against terrorism that day. So, see us during the break and uh, we'll fill you on and off all the information. Thank you for your time and Dick, thank you for your uh, letting us speak. Definitely a good cause we're supporting. So again, when they come asking, uh, please, please cooperate. Okay, so I'll continue on now and um, introduce you to uh, Dick Williams, uh, who is a local legend in his encyclopedic knowledge of Clinton and Kirkland. Um, he has been a village and town historian since 2000, holds a degree, history degree from Syracuse University, he has a master's from SUNY Albany and taught American history at Lafayette High School and Whitesboro High School. He's been, he was a president of the Historical Society from 72 to 74 and 99 through to uh, 2004. He's given many different programs um, to area audiences on numerous different um, topics. So I bring you Dick Williams. Thank you, Jim. Boy, I'm nervous. I just forgot my speech. What will we do? I've never talked to such a large crowd. That's wonderful. Uh, in 1998, in the same building, which had not been modified or redecorated as it is now, I gave, I gave the speech without any, any uh, PowerPoint. Back then, we didn't have PowerPoint, so I just gave a old-fashioned lecture. So now I have an illustrated p p lecture to give to you. One more set of lights, Jim, and it will be about the iron ore situation that we're all sitting over. And I brought a couple of artifacts up from downstairs. By the way, downstairs we have some old tools, some uh, more artifacts, but this is a, what a chunk of the ore looked like. Can you all see that? Uh, it's, it's red ore. It was called hematite. And uh, we're going to take you through a little bit of the history and for the next five or six hours. If you have to go to the bathroom, feel free. Uh, please go downstairs, though. Uh, also, uh, th this goes on and on, but the pictures are not the best. They were all taken back in 1890, 1880. So excuse the quality of the pictures, because they're, they're much older than many of us are. And uh, you can't do much about that. <clears throat> in any event, uh, we should have shades of that window. Aren't those beautiful stained glass windows, by the way? I'm glad the sun is out today. Some days when we have programs, the sun is not out. 
and you can't really appreciate that. How do you work this thing, Jim? Okay, here we go. Can you all see that? I guess it's the best I can do. I can't make it any lighter or darker. And I'm in the way here, probably, aren't I? Okay. Well, in 1797, if you recall, Clinton was founded in 1787, so within 10 years, some farmer found some ore up on Brimfield Street and also off Norton Ave, and that was, uh, that was on the surface. So the outcrops were there originally, and that's what was originally mined and then smelted and so forth. So uh, it was, it's been around for a while, whoops, excuse me, and there's an estimate that there is uh, over 150 million tons of ore. Now I always, when I used to teach uh, statistics, I used to talk about, there was a headline in the New York Times years ago that the, the city determined there were 1.8 million rats in New York City. And I always give this as an example, how the hell could they determine how many rats were in New York City? How many tons of ore are under here? There might be 149,000 or a million, who knows? But there's a lot of ore. And it's not the best ore, that's why we're out of business with it. Because the other ore is better than the Clinton ore. But if you're a chemist, it is uh, this Fe203. Is that right, Peter? Okay. I would be happy to entertain questions, but with so many people here, I don't know if I can do that or not. So if I make a mistake or say something wrong, please correct me right away. Okay. A little geology. I'm not a geologist, I'm a historian, so this may not be 100% accurate, but let's hopefully hope it's pretty accurate. Years ago, this area was covered by a low lagoon called the Silurian Sea, and the limestone was replaced by iron compounds from the Adirondack streams, from what I've discovered. And they're still found to some extent at outcrops, and these, these, these uh, other elements are in there too and small bits of magnesium and aluminum. It's usually about 60 to 80 feet above the surface here at about 680 feet above sea level. Now the park, for a reference, is about 660 feet, feet above sea level. Hamilton College is about 1150 or 8, 1180, I think it is, or maybe 1900 feet, so, so that gives you an idea. But if you go down uh, up on Brimfield Street, Kellogg Street, 60 to 80 feet, you'll probably hit the strata uh, of the of the iron ore, and this is nothing uh, unique to Clinton. This goes around the around the country, really. It goes east to uh, Cherry Valley, west to uh, Genesee River Gorge, Ontario County. Uh, it's in Wisconsin. Whoops, yeah, there we go. Wisconsin, Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, Missouri, Birmingham, Alabama, a big steel producing area, and that's where some of this ore was used. Not our ore, but they had ore down there. Mostly used for pig iron and castings. There was a brand called Glendale Stoves, used for window weights, Fairbanks scales, ornamental fixtures. It was not tough enough, unless it was mixed with other ore, to, to make a railroad tie, or railroad rails, I mean. So it could not be used for, for railroads, at least not for the rails. And it was used for some ornamental fixtures too, so there, there was a use for it. And uh, I've talked about the, the two blast furnaces here in a few moments. Can you all hear me? Is everybody, everybody happy today? Everybody's happy. That's wonderful. Okay. I'm sorry. Question? What's what? They feed it to pigs. <laughs> it's the big ig ignis. It's the big... Uh, you know, it's a big, I believe, it's a big cubic or whatever they are. That's what they, then they send them to other, other processing plants to make them, is that right? Does anybody else know a better answer for that? What is pig iron, huh? Yeah, large ignis, that's what I thought, thank you. That wasn't too far off. Okay, now how do you make iron? You gotta have three or four major things. Obviously you gotta have some iron ore, you gotta have some coke or coal, and you gotta have some limestone to make the ore. Now, as some of you know, there's a lot of quarries around here. You ever heard of Riscany Falls, the quarry out there? There's a quarry up on Post Street. There's a quarry up on Skyline Drive. There are many old quarries in, in the town of Kirkwood that were used years ago. But these are the three main elements. Whoops. Uh, let me excuse me here. The three main elements right here. 
Uh, so it also found a use as a paint pigment. Okay. Town of Kirkland map, not a very good one, but uh, we're talking about where it was found. And this is, uh, this is Brimfield Street. This is Kellogg Street. This, this area right here was the source of most of the mining, not all of it. There are some over here on Norton Ave, but uh, the bulk of it was up on Kellogg and New Street, Dawes Ave, uh, Brimfield Street in those areas there. And in New York State, the, the strata went west to it, even into Ontario. This uh, hematite ore was found in, in parts of Ontario and those other states I mentioned to you. Now, originally it was, it was on the surface. It was open mining, I guess they called it. Oh, by the way, I wanted to pass something out. I forgot. Where's that, Jim? I got it right here. So all of you can take a test afterwards. Would you pass that around, Gordy? It's like the time, a timeline of the ore. Okay, so the original ore was found on the surface. And today still, depending where you are on Brimfield Street or Tibbetts Road, I see Brimer Humphreys here, and there used to be some red spots on his farm on Tibbetts Road, right, Brimer? Uh, so, if you see red, red soil any place, it's probably the iron ore. And that was uh, nothing not unusual. So, when they originally, before the blast furnaces started in 1950, there were little forges. You ever heard of Forge Hollow between Waterville and Deansboro? Forge Hollow had what? Had a, had a forge. And that was, a, they'd make smaller tools, you know, probably nails or something. They didn't, use, didn't need a lot of iron ore but they used some of it. But uh, it, it went from open, the open trench to open cutting to strip mining and basically with manual, manual labor. It was not till later that they dug a hole down the ground. And I'll get to that in a few moments. Uh, and again, these are the areas. And the first underground mine was on Willow Hill. And I see Pete Burns is here. He lives on Willow Hill, don't you, Pete? Willow Hill is the first, if you go off Utica Street on Brimfield Street, that first ascent that then levels off at Dawes Ave, that's called Willow Hill. And we'll talk more about that later, so please remember Willow Hill. Uh, years ago, before the days of blast furnaces, they, they would transport it on wagons drawn by two or three horses with wide iron strips on the wooden wheels because this ore is heavy. This, this little chunk of ore here is quite heavy. So uh, Clinton, Clinton roads were all dirt back then and the story is that the roads were a mess all year because they were, they were carting ore all around the village and the town to these forges. They went over to uh, north of Rome there was one. That's Costantia there. Tayburg. Can you imagine being a teamster and, and driving a horse from Clinton to Tayburg on a summer day? Huh? I can't. Uh, then, of course, after the railroad came and the canal, this changed the whole situation a bit. The canal started in the 1836 or 7 period. So then they got coal out of Pennsylvania, which was a big help. And uh, finally, or after 1866, rather, the railroads came to town. First of all, it was the New York Oswego and Midland, the NYO and M. And then they had several bankruptcies, but anyhow, it finally became the NYO and W, uh, which was the Ontario and Western. Though there's a story of a student that wanted to go to Hamilton back in the 1890s, and uh, he wrote to President Stryker about.